Então, Paulo, é um prazer te ter aqui na Unicinos. Agradecemos a tua gentileza de conversar conosco nesse workshop. Como a gente conversou antes, a ideia é apresentar para e deixar registrado para os alunos que têm interesse aqui em filosofia experimental uh, um material que eles possam ter como referência na hora de saber como é que se faz <risos> esse negócio. ok? Então, uh, tu tem o tempo que a gente combinou, em torno de uma hora para a tua apresentação. É, mais, é, mais ou menos uma hora? Isso, em torno de uma hora. ok? Tá. Muito obrigado, a palavra é, contigo. Primeiro, muito obrigado pelo convite. E o tema do meu talk é harm e morality. The relationship between harm and morality. So here is the overview. Okay, first, I'm going to just give a general delimitation of the topic. Then I will put morality into the picture. Then I will discuss more specifically the relationship between harm and morality. Okay. So let's just start with the general delimitation of the topic. Types of judgments. There are different types of judgments relevant to the topic of morality. Judgments of character relate to virtue and vice. Judgments of responsibility relate to praise and blame. Normative judgments relate to what one should do, what should not do, and right and wrong relate to this. And judgments of value, good and bad. So I will focus here on normative judgments. Okay. More specifically. Normative judgments may be used for prediction, you know, norms. And if you know what's, what someone should do or you know that it's wrong for someone to do something, you can use this to predict people's behavior. But I'm not interested in this folk sociological uh, usage of normative judgments. I'm interested here, the points about how people use normative judgments to make evaluations. Okay? And I want to be, of course, people make judgments use normative judgments to make evaluations and also to motivate their behavior. So I'm not be focusing on motivation either. So it will be just the topic of judgments themselves in, uh, in terms of their evaluative character. Okay? Uh, and I will be related to negative judgments. I'm interested in judgments of wrongdoing, not the right thing to do. Okay? Uh, okay. Now, Let's try to specify a little bit what is, what do I mean by normative judgments in terms of norms and the concept of wrongdoing as norm transgression. Starting with norm as a deontic concept. Okay, basic concepts refer to things. I'm talking about things in very general terms, properties, objects, or whatever. Okay, uh, for example concept of apple refers to apples. This is trivial, but it's a kind of just to make things clear here. And also, concepts may have an or a taxonomic organization in terms of a structure. So the concept of fruit subsumes the concept of apple and orange. And you can, I'm using kind of set theoretical way of describing the relationship between concepts and what they refer to, just to simplify things, but it's clear enough. Uh, now, What are the ontic concepts? The ontic concepts, prototypically at least, they refer to actions. Okay? And what I want to characterize here is what is a norm as a deontic concept. Uh, five, four deontic concepts may be characterized like this. Here, I, what I say is A refers to actions, A1, A2, A3, different types of actions. And there is the concept of what is forbidden. For example, a type of action here, here would be killing an innocent person. And there is the superordinate concept of what is permitted, which subsumes what is discretionary and what is obligatory. Discretionary, prototypically going to the cinema. Okay. Obligatory, providing care for one's children. This, the only concepts, may be reorganized in this way. You take out, oh, it's not showing properly here. The discretionary should be. So is it the, is it the, the, uh, the PDF file? Anyway, uh, let's continue here. No, no, there's no time to change the file uh, because sometimes lose format. So discretionary should be here in the same direction of obligatory and forbidden. So the point here, I took the concept of 
permitted out of the picture and reorganize here the deontic concepts, then you have the opposition between discretionary and normative. Normative is a concept that subsumes what is obligatory and forbidden. In a nutshell, there are two types of norms, norms that obligate and norms that forbid. Okay, so here, providing care of one's own children, obligatory, killing an innocent person, forbidden, going to the cinema, just reorganizing the, uh, the, the concepts. Now, interestingly, the uh, other concepts also refer to omissions, which I'm describing here as negation of an action. Okay? So what is discretionary? Doing what is discretionary, not doing what is discretionary. Doing, if something is discretionary, not doing it's also discretionary. Now, interestingly, if you don't do what is obligatory, it's forbidden. And if you, uh, and it not doing what is forbidden is obligatory. So here, provide A2, providing cares for one children is obligatory. Not providing care for one's children is forbidden. Killing an innocent person is forbidden. Not killing an innocent person is obligatory. Okay? So, so summarizing here, there are two types of norms. Norms that obligate and norms that forbid. Okay, and this is the domain of normative that I'm, I'm talking about. And the norm, domain of the normative is in contraposition to what is discretionary. Just pay attention that sometimes people use the word permitted not in the superordinate sense that I'm pointing out here, but also in the sense of discretionary. So ordinary language is polysemous. So uh, but the, there is clearly a sense of permitted that is superordinate in this sense that I'm characterizing here. Here is, uh, this table here is from an article that I published some time ago, but it's, it's somewhat related to some work in the ONTE reasoning. I, I, I really like the work of uh, Sigmar Beller. He's a German psychologist. I think his work is really good. So it, it's a little bit compatible with, the, uh, with this, uh, his work, although he does not, uh, he does not in include all these the, this distinctions that I'm trying to make here. Okay, so what is wrong with doing as a normal a norm transgression. So this is trivial. It follows directly. Transgression wrong is what is forbidden. Is what does not follow the normative. Okay, it's do it's wrong when you do what is forbidden, and when not do when you do not do what is obligatory. Okay? This is the concepts that I'm interested in. Okay, for example, killing an innocent person or not providing care for one's children. It's a case of wrongdoing transgressions of norms. Supposing that there is a norm that you should not kill an innocent person, there is an obligatory norm that you should provide care to your children. Uh, I don't know whether there is a way of interrupting because I don't want to be talking. Is there, can I, some people interfere if they don't understand or should, just, should I just go ahead and? No, just, just go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, so okay. Now, because okay. sometimes it's good to check whether I'm going to fast or, and uh, probably I'm going to fast actually. But anyway, uh, okay, so uh, in summary, in terms of the first part, I'm interested here in concept, normative concepts. They are related to norms and they're related to wrongdoing as norm transgression. So far, I didn't even mention the word morality, okay? Normative judgments are something much broader than morality, okay? So, so the second part here, I would like to specify what I mean by morality, okay? Uh, first of all, let's, so we are, want to specify morality as a specific type of normative judgment. Okay. What is more specific, since I'm interested in evaluative, negative evaluated or evaluative judgments of wrongdoing, I would like to specify what is moral wrongdoing. Okay. Uh, 
first of all, I have to eliminate some kind of possible misunderstandings here. Morality here is about what ordinary people think. Okay, I'm not interested in normative ethics. I'm not a, a philosopher trying to, uh, you know, prescribe what is morally wrong. Okay, just to eliminate this, this type of. I'm a cognitive anthropologist. You know, I have a good background in philosophy, and I love experimental philosophy. But my my project is basically psych psychological anthropological. Okay. Now, and this is the second point, is a little bit more subtle. Morality here is not about what ordinary people think, what ordinary people think about the concepts of morality, or the meanings of, of the word morality. This is a subtle issue that I, I think many psychologists and even philosophers do not get this point. And many, you see this one, you see many people using the word moral in the way they operationalize questions about morality. The point is that it's doubtful that the word moral has translation in many, many languages. Okay? Uh, one thing is what people, when they think about, hear about morality, what they think is morality, you know, ordinary people. This is one type of project. It's in, it would be interesting to see you know, whether there is a coherence you know, in terms of how people conceptualize morality, their concept, whether the word morality has a stable meaning, how polysemous it is. This is one project of trying to specify uh, morality, which is more or less of kind of trying to do conceptual analysis of ordinary language or something like this. So this is not my project here. I don't think this is the best way to go in terms of discussing moral judgments. So in my perspective, Morality here is about a specific way in which ordinary people make normative judgments of wrongdoing. It's not about what they think about the meaning of the word morality, what you ask them, what is morality to you? No, it's about a specific way that uh, normative judgments are deployed. Okay? Now, there are two basic ways of trying to specify uh, moral, moral judgments in terms of this uh, way of making normative judgments. One that I think it's a kind of a little bit arbitrary is just to think about the type of content involved in a normative judgment. For example, is it that an woman should not kill an innocent person? Is it because what is this content? Is it related to being unjust to kill an innocent person is it so, although you cannot completely avoid this what i'm going to pursue here is a slightly different way of characterizing uh, moral judgments and it's more based the ground here is the type of conviction involved in a normative judgment okay what is the type of certainty or the type of you know, conviction involved when you say that this is wrong. Okay? So to be, I'll be focusing on this kind of, there are, this is a slightly different tradition of, of trying to delimit uh, normative judgments and call them moral. Okay? I'm not saying that it's perfect, that there may be some kind of arbitrariness there, but that's the way I'm going to pursue it here, okay? And this leads to the Turial tradition, which has a specific way of characterizing normative conviction. There are other approaches to normative conviction in the psychological literature. So there are disputes about what is exactly involved in normative convictions, the notion of objectivity, authority, dependence. People use different type of criteria to specify what is the type of normative conviction related to moral judgments. But I'm going to be pursuing here uh, uh, the characterization given by the Turial tradition. The Turial tradition uh, comes from this work in developmental psychology, uh, in, uh, this, you know, 
main figure is Eliot Turiel. But there are other prominent researchers as well, Larry Knutsch, uh, Judith Smetana. And I'm going to be focusing on this uh, uh, developmental psychology literature and the debates that uh, around this tradition because part of my work during the last years was uh, you know, focused on this kind of debate, okay, around the Turiel tradition. So the Turiel tradition so tries to specify moral judgments in contraposition to conventional judgments, okay? And there is what, you know, in the literature becomes kind of nor normal to use the notion of as a moral signature in moral judgments in contraposition to a conventional signature in conventional judgments of wrongdoing. And the basic thing here is that whether you, you like it or not, we cannot think that all judgments of wrongdoing are, are moral because we can expand morality to everything, but you know, there are some judgments of etiquette that perhaps in some contexts people uh, moralize it, but there are some conventions that people, when they don't follow, it's wrong, but it's not, look, it's wrong, but is it really wrong in itself? Is it just wrong because it does not follow the convention? There are some difference between normative judgments in terms of what people think that is involved when something does not follow a norm uh, should be made. So, and that, that's the attempt that Turiel uh, tried to make. Basically, the two criteria that I'm going to be invoking here, and you know, Turiel tradition used various kinds of criteria. It's not completely coherent. There is, you know, all of these literatures, there is a little bit of uh, there's something that is messy and people, you know, it's normal, research programs are not completely coherent. But I'm going to use here, I'm going to be using here two criteria that uh, 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 at least were important in my work and in the debate uh, around uh, the Turiel tradition. The first is authority contingency. The contraposition here is this. Moral transgressions and the norms forbidding them are seen as independent of authority. It means that their wrongness is not cancelable by the decision of any authority. On the other hand, conventional transgressions and the norms forbidding them depend on authority. Their wrongness is cancelled by the decision of a legitimate authority. Much of this work has been done with uh, children because developmental research. So basically, when you think about a norm like uh, Think about asking questions about wrongdoing about uh, for young children, okay? And if you ask a children, uh, young children, oh, is it wrong to hit another child just for fun? People say no. Children, young children say no. Now, what if the teacher in your school says no? Is it it's okay? to hit another children for, for fun. So the idea here is that children will have, because in this kind of scenario, people will, even if the, 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 the teacher says it's okay, they will resist. They won't change their judgment. They will still think that, oh, no, it's still wrong, okay? Now, if you contrapose to another conventional rule that you should not call your children by her first name, Okay? There's a convention in the school. And what about now if the teacher, the authority, legitimate authority, changed the rule? Says, no, it's okay now to, to, call, to call myself or other teachers, you know, the decision by the, authority, the director of the school, or whatever, the most legitimate authority in the context of the school. Then people will have the intuition that, oh, now it's okay. So that's the intuition that they are trying to tap here in terms of uh, the, the authority contingency uh, uh, criterion, okay? And they have done research even in the context of using God as the authority, okay? You create scenarios about, for example, is it okay to hit another person just for fun? 
and then people say no. And then what if God now said that it's okay? It seems that people resist, even if you have an upper authority like this. And that's the idea here, okay? Now the generality is a, a, a different kind of, of, of uh, criteria, criterion, okay? But the idea here is that when you think that something is morally wrong, you tend to extend it to other place, even if, you know, it's a completely different kind of a social context. For example, if you think that uh, hitting another person uh, just for fun is wrong, you would think that it's wrong here and it's wrong wherever it happens. Okay, even if in the other place you have different norms. Okay, your intuition is that as long as you interpret morality in a certain way, you are going to extend it, the notion of wrongness, to other places as well. And in conventional transgressions, then this does not make sense because, for example, if you ask you to take about the, 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 the point about calling uh, the, the teacher by the first name. If you ask, suppose in a school it's forbidden, okay, so you ask, is it wrong? People say it's wrong here. But then if you ask another school, there is no rule against that. The director or the, the school or whoever decided that it's okay to then is it wrong to call the teacher by her first name in that school? So you have the intuition, no, then it does not does not make sense to extend the sense that this is wrong to the other context. Okay? So to be sincere, I think things are a bit more complicated than this because there is some ambiguity in this kind of uh, these kind of criteria here. Because, in fact, originally, these kind of, in my interpretation, these kind of criteria was were, was trying. They were trying to tap into some kind of notion of objectivity. Okay, as if people want to make moral judgments of wrongdoing, they think that's kind of something that is intrinsically wrong, independent of what whoever thinks about it. But these criteria, as they were used in the moral conventional task that we are going to describe in a moment, they do not completely prove objectivism in terms of moral judgment. But I will leave aside this subtle issue here. We can discuss, can return this later if you want in terms of in our discussion. Just check here how much I'm going to do I'm doing here in terms of time. So kind of half an hour, almost half an hour. Okay. So, but the Tudio tradition had an additional point. That moral transgression is the sense of this conviction that in, in, uh, has the kind of the moral signature that I would describe. When you think about wrongdoing, it's authority independent and it's generalizable to other places. They had this claim that there is an equivalence between this kind of moral signature and harming justice transgressions. Okay? This was an important claim of the Tuyal tradition. And there has been two main criticisms, two types of criticisms to this uh, claim. Okay? And that's what I'm going to cover here. And then I'm going to focus on one of the criticisms that, you know, uh, the work that I was talking about, that I've, I've part of my work during the last years is related to one of these criticisms. One of the criticisms, the first criticism comes from Schroeder and Jonathan Haidt, and just basically, Autoriel is wrong because people moralize, in the, in the sense of the moral signature, they moralize domains other than harm and injustice, okay? So the basic criticism here is that domains other than the domain related to basic rights, justice, harm, evo also evoke the moral signature. And famously, nowadays, you know, Hyde program, it talks about five types, at least, at least five types of moral domains. 
and it's kind of normally you know, first to harm and injustice a little bit what Turiel said. There's some vagueness there, but they talk and emphasize a lot these other three types of moral domains. So people also moralize things related to betrayal and group loyalty, things related to hierarchy and subversion, degra degra degradation deg and purity. The most famous example was related to purity. You know, I, don't, I don't know whether you've read this classical article of, of Hyde. In fact, the research was done partially in Brazil. And he uses scenarios like this. A man goes to the supermarket once a week and buys a dead chicken. But before cooking the chicken, he has sexual intercourse with it. Then he cooks it and eats it. So he gave evidence that Presumably, he gave, I, I don't believe all the, the evidence that he gave because there, there are many technical issues there. But let's suppose that the picture is more or less correct. So it, this, this evidence is that people had the same kind of strong conviction that this is wrong as they had you know, in terms of injustice trans, trans, transgressions, the, the prototypical uh, Turial domain. So then there is debate nowadays about you know, moral pluralism, and moral monism. Okay? Some people tend to be more monists, think that no uh, morality is related only to certain kinds of domains. Some people are more pluralist, think no, there are. Uh, but interestingly, Haidt, you know, in the, in the beginning he was debating with Turiel, and, and he used a kind of a methodology that was kind of trying to uh, include probes that uh, tap into the criteria that we discussed before in terms of the moral signature. Nowadays, they kind of change a little bit the methodology, and so it's a little bit deviated from the original debate from uh, with Turiel. And so nowadays, a little bit vaguer, the notion of moral domains is not completely clear whether he's really giving complete evidence that people have the exact kind of a strong normative conviction to all these domains. And also whether in conflict between the domains, whether people would think that one domain is more important than the other. So but leaving this aside, I'm sympathetic to moral pluralism. I think basically I don't think that uh, uh, morality is just related to one domain like harm and justice. Okay? I, I'm sympathetic to to, to height. And I have actually work that I'm not going to show here, actually that I recent, uh, recently uh, did, you know, submitted that I'm kind of confident that moral pluralism is in the right direction. But the other debate that you know, appeared in the literature in the last 10 years or so was criticizing the other side of, of uh, Turiel. And this is the second criticism. And it was raised initially by Stephen Stitch, Fessler, and Daniel Kelly. And there is a series of art articles that, uh, you know, S Stephen Stitch probably knows a philosopher. Daniel Fessler is a, an anthropologist. D Daniel Kelly is a philosopher as well. So they have a series of uh, articles criticizing the two tradition, trying to claim that harm transgressions do not, also, not always evoke the moral signature. It's just, so it's not just that. Uh, to be always wrong in the sense that there are other moral domains, but he's also wrong in the sense that even the domain that Turiel was really confident about does not really always evoke the moral signature. People don't think that harmful transgressions are always authority independent and generalizable, okay? So that's the debate that I'm going to describe here because I think these guys, are, their research program is basically flawed, okay? And uh, in a series of articles, me and my collaborators, you know, responding to their uh, approach. Now, it's a debate. The last version of the approach was this article here in response to that, this one that moral parochialism. So what I, these were my PhD students, although Colin Holbrook, now 
he's on the other side. The last article is he was he, he finished his PhD here. He he went to work with Fessler because Fessler came here. We are all friends, okay? There's no real conflict here. Fessler came here to our institute. We it's a a debate, okay? So, but I will try to show at least my point of view on this debate and what I think this their perspective is really flawed, completely flawed. Okay, so I'm going to be, just be sincere. I did think that we are completely flawed. Okay, I'm not going to try to be more polite than this because this is to be it's hypocrisy. You no, know, it's not good in size either. So, uh, so basically, what I'm going to do here is try to uh, explain in this second criticism what is my my take on this issue about the relationship between harm and morality, and this is related to the other two dom two domains: that harm and justice. Uh, not the other three domains of, it's just about the basic to real claim, okay? Whether it evoke, invoke, you know, when people think that transgression that involve harm and injustice, whether they tend to think that is authority independent and generalizable, okay? Now, so these are the publications. If you want more details about the publication, you can see the publication here on my web page of our institute. Uh, okay, so let's. The complicated thing here is that, you know, as much as, you know, probably you are aware that a lot of debates in the literature is just people, people misunderstand each other because they use words in different ways, or they are vague and not coherent in terms of the way they use the words. So the, the first issue here is how you define harm and how do you define things like synchronous injustice. Harm. You know, in Portuguese, you say dano, causar dano as outras pessoas, to harm someone. There are connotations. In the basic sense of harm that we want to take into account here is just actions that cause pain or suffering, or more broadly, cause uh, welfare reduction. Okay? But of course, there are connotations of the word harm that already involves wrongdoing or injustice. But if you want to go to the mass of ordinary language, then policy, then you won't arrive anywhere. The point is that I, it's important to have a, a reasonable notion of harm. And a reasonable notion of harm uh, is the limit to the causation of pain or suffering, or a little bit more broadly, causation of welfare reduction. Okay? So having this in mind, what is the relevant hypothesis on the relationship between harm and morality in the sense of the moral signature. Turiel had this hypothesis, okay? The Turiel hypothesis, moral transgressions, transgressions whose wrongness is seen as general in scope and authority dependent, are equivalent to harm and justice transgressions. Turiel was vague. He didn't have a very clear hypothesis about this. And people are still vague about it. Think about the distinction between that uh, height makes between the harm and the injustice domain. It's not clear enough, okay? So, but when you take into account, and the criticism that Stitch and uh, uh, Fessler initially raised, capitalize on this vagueness. They are just picking up the most weird interpretation. The oh, this is trivially false, as if. So, we enter this debate trying to, you know, acknowledge that there is some vagueness in this debate, but trying to. Think about what is a reasonable hypothesis here in terms of the relationship between harm and morality. So, then let me describe some possible hypotheses and the one that we think is reasonable and the one that we think that is confirmed. Okay. The other ones we think is just not even it's an unknown starter. Think about the first hypothesis. Keep in mind that the sense of harm here is just the sense of causation of pain or suffering, or a little bit more broadly, causation of welfare reduction. Hypothesis one, if an action is considered to be harmful, it's considered to be a transgression whose wrongness is general in scope and authority independent. Look, this hypothesis is just an only starter. Many cases of harmful actions are not even considered to be wrong. To start with, think about justified punishment. There are many, many contexts that causing harm to other people is not a case of wrongdoing. Remember, the debate here is just about wrongdoing. Okay, so 
This hypothesis is a known starter. This is one of the criticisms that we raised to, to Stitch. Oh, uh, what is, what is, and no one kind of would defend this hypothesis because it's just trivially false. It's just irrelevant. Because many cases of harmful actions are, are permitted. It's not wrong to, to harm another in punishment, in self-defense, you know, in many contexts. Think about sports, box, for example. That is, it's justified, okay? Uh, now, not even Turiel thought that. So I thought also that would be a very unfair interpretation uh, to interpret Turiel saying this. And this is a passage from Turiel. From a child to regard the harmful act in event A as wrong or as a transgression, it's not necessary to be told by the other that it's wrong. Rather, the child, and he's talking about morally wrong, okay, in the sense of the moral signature. Rather, the child, child can generate prescriptions through abstractions from the experience itself, either as an observer or a participant. Important elements in the perception perception of such an event would be the pain experienced by the victim and the reason for the offender's act. So, really, you're not just concerned about whether an action is causing pain or suffering or is reducing the welfare of others. You're concerned about what are the reasons involved in the causation of pain and, and, and suffering. Okay? Now, after we raised this criticism in response to our article, Stitch and Fesser put forward this sec hypothesis too that they think is widespread in the literature. That they think that I think was just an ad hoc way of trying to, you know, oh, we're not confused. We we have we had a, a clear idea of what is going on in mind, what is going on in terms of the hypothesis that we're testing. And this hypothesis too is like is like this. If an action is considered to be harmful, and if it's also considered to be a transgression, even for reasons that have little or nothing to do with the fact that it's harmful, its wrongness is considered to be authority independent and general scope. I'm using formalism here, but not, you know, not going to be in details. It's just to formalize what I'm saying here. So here is the quote from their response to our, our article in Cognition, 2009. What the hypothesis claims is that any action that is judged to be a transgression, for whatever reason, and it's also judged to be harmful, will evoke the moral signature. This one strategy, one strategy we use to this one strategy we use to construct scenarios designed to test this hypothesis was to describe cases of harmful actions that participants might classify as a transgression for, little, for reasons that had little or nothing to do with the fact that they are harmful. If H1, hypothesis of Tulio, is true, cases such as this should evoke the moral signature pattern. But this, look, this is, this is a completely crazy hypothesis. And they, they suggested that it's widespread in the literature and they cited in this article, Sean Nichols. But think about what Sean Nichols, who, in this context, in saying that, it's not simply about harm in itself, but it's about the normative theory as well. A normative theory is not intended in any inflated sense. Rather, even a motley set of rules prohibiting certain behaviors will count as a normative theory. The normative theory of central interest to us, however, is the normative theory prohibiting harmful actions. Okay? The, the last part here should have deleted. So the point is this. If you're talking about transgressions related to harm, what is relevant? There's norms prohibiting harm. If an action is harm, but it's considered to be wrong for reasons completely independent, so what, what is the point? You're not discussing harmful transgression at all. So I think this is just a crazy response to something that they were trying to, sh to say that they were, uh, they really knew what they were really, the hypothesis they were testing, but going in a direction that I, I think is completely crazy. Uh, anyway, so then we, 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 we claim that the reason why hypothesis is a kind of deflationary hypothesis about the relationship between harm and morality. And this is our hypothesis, okay? If an action is considered to be harmful in the sense that are delimited, and if the causation of harm 
is considered to involve injustice, its wrongness is considered to be authority independent and general in scope. This is because we hypothesize that the full concept of injustice implies transgression as well as authority independence and generality. So let me unpack a little bit here what I'm saying here. Because, of course, there is the concept of injustice here that I'm not analyzing. But the concept of injustice that I have in mind here is something very, very general. It's basically something when you think that uh, someone is harming uh, another person for selfish reasons. Basically, you're not taking into account the interests of others. Okay? And I think that when you, you think about an action involves this type of selfishness, you intuitively you think, oh, this is wrong in itself. This is wrong. This is wrong. Okay? And then, if you are prompt to you have this intuition, if people ask you, would you change your opinion if your authority uh, uh, says that it's okay? No, your intuition is strong enough to maintain your opinion. If in another place this occurs and you still interpret, interpret the situation as involving this kind of injustice, you still think, no, it's still wrong. No. And note that I'm not claiming here that people have to represent the concept of authority, independence, and generalizability. These are complex concepts. I'm just claiming that the psychological mechanism that deliver intuitions of fairness or injustice in this sense, and there is some uh, evolutionary uh, work that I'm sympathetic to, uh, work by uh, uh, Bomar and Sperber, uh, about intuition about fairness, in, in evolution of inter, intuition of fairness, that we have this intuitive mechanism. And then that's it, okay? The, the probes that we use does not mean that, and this, that people have this concept, this part of the concept of, of, uh, of moral transgression, the, the, tr the trait uh, authority independence or general, 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 general ability. Because this would be crazy, because we would suppose that children who have these intuitions they would have to have the concepts of authority, independence, and general ability. This doesn't make sense. Okay? They're two complex concepts. But basically, you interpret the situation as involving selfishness in the sense that people are not taking into account the interests of others. Then you have the intuition of it is intrinsically wrong. That's the basic idea. So let's go to the evidence. Then I'm going to let me 15 minutes here, 20 minutes. So I'm going to discuss now the evidence of this debate between myself and my collaborators and Stephen Stitch and Fellows uh, group. Okay. There are two things here that we have to be careful to separate. First, what I'm calling prima facie evidence. It's just, you know, all this kind of research is a kind of scenario research. Basically, you create scenarios about types of actions and you ask questions to participants. Okay. And then what I'm talking about, prima facie evidence, is the response, quantitative response that they give. You ask, you ask yes or no questions, they say yes or no. Okay, this is a quantitative evidence. I call it prima facie evidence. I don't think this is enough. Okay, thorough evidence. I think whenever you have uh, this kind of scenario research, you need more qualitative type of evidence. You have to ask participants to justify their answers, okay? And analysis of justifications, I think, is fundamental to give thorough evidence to this kind of question. Here I'm going against, you know, the fashion nowadays that is, oh, justification is just confabulation, it's just this stuff is not irrelevant. I think there are two arguments against this, but I'm going to come back to this later. Let's go to the prima facie evidence that they provided. We have to return here to the moral conventional test. Moral conventional test was this basic scenario type of research that is, was utilized to give evidence about the moral signature. Basically, you create an action scenario, okay, that supposedly, according to your pre-theoretical intuitions, you know, one case is of transgression to be moral, one case will be conventional. And in the moral case, an innocent child is pushed off a swing. This is a context of a developmental research, okay, giving the scenarios to children. Conventional example, a child eats lunch with fingers, okay? Then the first question, okay, of the moral conventional test is a kind of manipulation probe, manipulation check probe, because you just ask, is it okay to do that? 
you don't want to people to say no, because this is evident that you consider it as a transgression in the first place. Because you're interested here in delimiting what is moral transgression. But if people don't consider moral transgression in the first place, what is the point? It does not make any even sense, okay? In many cases, you know, in, in, of conventional transgressions, people have intuition that maybe it's not even transgression, it's more on the discretionary side. Think about eating lunch with fingers. If you go to a hippie community, people think, oh, eating lunch with fingers, oh, it's discretionary. But these people eat lunch the way they want, okay? There's no even convention about it. So you need first to delimit that Contrapositions between moral and conventional transgressions. If people don't pass this first manipulation check probe, they just have to eliminate, be eliminated from the data. Then normally you have a justification probe. Okay, explain your answer, and then you have the two types of uh, probes that are related to the signature that we were talking about before. The authority contingency probe. What if an authority says that it's okay to do A? Person said no first. Now what is the authority says okay? Would it be okay for X to do A? In another place, in our time, people think that it's okay to do A. Is it okay for people in this place to do A? Okay. The prediction of the Turiel is that for conventional transgressions, people would say no to the manipulation check probe, but then they would say yes for the other probes. And for the moral example, people would keep saying no, no, okay, because no, it's wrong. But it's independent of authority, it's independent of place, okay? So they did this, their initial research, they did this, they created five scenarios. I'm going to describe just uh, three scenarios here. For, and they used, for each of the scenarios, they used only one of the uh, signature proofs, okay? So there are the slavery, generality, uh, scenario, action scenario. In the United States, slaves were an important part of the economy of the South 20 years ago. In Amer American slaves were used mainly to maintain household and supply agricultural labor. Was it okay for Americans to keep slaves? They were supposed that people here were going, no. But the point now, would they generalize this to the context of Greece and Rome in the past? I'm not going to read everything, okay? So generally, the probe, would people generalize it or they would keep saying that it's no, it's wrong, still wrong there, okay? So they were trying to think, their hypothesis is that people say yes, it's okay in the past, okay? Uh, I'm talking about not Turiel again now. Turiel hypothesis, no, no. But Fessler, I'm describing here the research of Fessler, okay, sorry. Maybe I, I, I passed this point. This scenario is here was their research, okay? Fessler trying to criticize Turio. Fessler and Stitch trying to criticize Turio. The other scenario was a kind of whipping genera generality. Miss, Mr. Adams is an officer on a large modern American cargo ship in 2004. One night, while at sea, he finds a sailor drunk at a time when the sailor should have been monitoring the radar screen. After the sailor sobers up, Adams punished the sailor by giving him five slashes, five lashes with a whip. So manipulation probe is that they were supposed that people would say no, but then the general ability probe, they are creating the same context but 300 years ago. So one thing that is important to note here, this is a case of punishment. There are much more complex than the cases that Turiel used in the initially. Okay, so this case of punishment are much more complex. But let's leave this problem aside. Okay, the prediction here of uh, Stitch is that you're going to say it's okay 300 years ago. And then there was the whipping authority. There is the same kind of scenario, but instead of uh, whipping 300 years ago, it's just now there is an authority continuing to probe. Now suppose that the captain of the modern cargo ship had told Mr. Adams that on this ship it's okay for officers to whip sailors. So they were saying that although people, Fessler and Stitch, although people would say no for the first question, 
they then would be susceptible to change their response when an authority uh, enforces a different opinion. Okay. Okay. So there are other scenarios that are. Uh, it is related to what I was saying. These scenarios are very complex. We discuss this point about you know these scenarios that depart substantially from what the types of scenarios that Suryo used, and the other scenarios involve kind of utilitarian harm. If you want to check the, our discussion of the other scenarios, uh, you check this article here. But basically, I'm going to focus on that those three scenarios. So what were the results? Here, the slavery scenario, the weeping general scenario, the weeping authority. First, here in one is the percentage who said yes to the manipulation check probe and the percentage of who said yes to the authority or general, generality probe, depending on the scenarios, okay? And they claim. In the slave scenarios, we again found a dramatic difference. 11% of subjects report that slavery was okay in German, Greek, or Roman societies, but only 7% reported it was okay in the American South. Well, it's a little bit weird here because it's different. Look, no dramatic difference there. Well, it seems that they are mixing effect size with the significance. But this is not the worst problem. The worst problem is that what they did here, they pulled the data. This is all participants, percentage of participants that answered yes here, percentage of participants who answered, answered to the second probe. But it's not the way to analyze the data. We do analyze the data. You have to analyze the four patterns of responses of each individual can have. Individual answers may be of four types. They may answer no to the manipulation check, no to the authority dependence. They may answer no to the manipulation check, and yes to the authority independence. They may ask, answer yes, yes, and yes, no. The only evidence that is relevant is the first two, because they, the first is confirmation to, to Yale's hypothesis. The second is confirmation to his hypothesis. So we reanalyze their data take into account these patterns of response and replicate their results. And then we found these patterns, okay? These are their original results. This is our replication, okay? A and B, A is no, no answers. The generally slavery scenario that they used, 89% evinced a no, no pattern of response. And no in the recent press, recent you know, American slavery, and no, not okay, okay, in, in the context of Greek home. Rome, okay? So this is the pooling problem eliminate. You have to analyze, you see here that things change completely. Okay? Why do you have here a kind of stand? Here you go, you have a quite different pattern. But then there is another problem because there is manipulation check problem because you have these participants who answered C and D patterns, they have to be eliminated because they are irrelevant. They, they thought that it was yes, that it was okay in the first place. So they're irrelevant. They're not, they didn't consider to be transgressed to, to start with. So if you reanalyze the data then like this, then you, you see what is the real A is confirmation to, to, to your hypothesis. B, it is confirmation. You see that the great majority here was, was think about, in their scenario, 95% confirmed, confirmed to real, 5% against. What does it mean now that dramatic difference that we're talking about? It does not make any sense. Of course, there are cases like this that are a little bit still. Let me show. There was another problem. What is the piracy confound problem? Okay, Basically, Piracy confound problem was raised by them, they, they themselves. Is that the, I, the problem is that, you know, if you think about uh, people taking care of a ship, okay, recently, there is no context of piracy. There's no, you don't think about, it's not a war context, but 300 years ago, people think about, oh, not doing that, not supervising the ship, maybe have much more dangerous consequence. So it makes more sense. And calibration of, uh, of punishment is calibrated by the perception of what are the bad consequences of your act. So there was a confound there. And they did. They recognized this. 
And they did the research. I'm not going to do the detail. Try to eliminate the confound. And they reversed the results. Check this article here. They themselves reversed the results. Okay? Because here, after my criticism, they start to analyze. In this article here, they analyze the data in the way that we analyze the data here. Okay? I'm not using inferential statistics here because it's a little bit trivial. Okay? Anyway, just... I'm not going to discuss all the more recent debate. I'm just going to point out that in this more recent debate, where you have this response, they addressed all this kind of criticism that you pointed out before, trying to be thorough. But they then pursued a kind of another chip, uh, what I think, another tricky type of analysis of the data using regression that I do think completely unco uh, the, uh, obscure the pattern of results. Yet when you analyze the data the way that we were analyzing before, the results are the great majority in all contexts were confirmation to 2 But this I'm, I'm not going to the details. So you can check this R2C. Okay, so but don't, don't, then what is thorough evidence? What I said before is that these were just taking into account the, the patterns of response, yes or no response to probes. Okay? Now, is it is this enough? I don't think it's enough. First, because if you don't take into account you know, what people say about this stuff, you know, language is a mess. You have to be first careful about how people are interpreting the probes and everything. And the first problem in this kind of research is what I called initially, this was the issue, one of the, our criticisms to their debate, the initial debate, is there was a descriptive reading problem. The grammatical form of the manipulation check and authority generality probes is like this. Is it okay for Mr. X to perform action A? There are two readings into this question. One is the evaluated reading. Is it okay that Mr. X perform action A? In this case, people, you are supposed that people are going to respond to this, giving their evaluative take on the issue. But there is a descriptive reason, reading of this question. You may think that, oh, according to Y, is it okay that Mr. X perform action A? Think about the example of slavery, okay? I bet, and we saw some evidence that people, oh, was it okay uh, for people to have slavery uh, in Greek Roman times? You can read this stuff, oh, according to them, it was okay. But you may still think that it was wrong, in your evaluative opinion, that to keep slaves there, okay? So let me give another kind of evidence that this ambiguity exists in this kind of probes, okay? Think about the whipping generality pair, okay? Your okay question, okay? The, the manipulation check. Is it okay for Mr. Adam to eat the sailor whipping forbidden now? No, I believe receiving lashes for insubordination is too extreme. Now, scenario two, whipping permitted 300 years ago. Is it okay for Mr. Williams to whip the sailor? Yes, but look at this justification. Such was the standard of the time and what was expected from the sailors and the offers. However, it's still wrong. So, however, it's still wrong seems to suggest, that in fact, the participants think that it's still wrong. And that his yes answer was just describing what were the norms of the time. Okay? Now, take this, and this was a no yes pattern of response that is against Turiel. If you take into account this quali qualitative response, probably is no no, because the opinion of the participant is still wrong. So this case would be evidence in favor of Turiel. Now take this other, okay, I'm finishing, okay, I'm one hour now, but I, 10 minutes I'll finish. Taking this other example here of the whipping generality pair. So whipping forbidden now, is it okay? Why should it be? That's the justification, explanation of the, the participant, okay? Now, scenario two, whipping permitted 300 years ago. Is it okay for Mr. Williams to whip the sailor. Now here the guy is, the participant is expressing his opinion. No, still no. And, but he's explicitly shown the ambiguities involved in this kind of probes. 
It depends on what OK means. If it means it's acting according to rules, then it's OK. If it means it's OK according to our rules, probably the answer is no. We have different ways of whipping nowadays. We don't actually whip, so, but we use other means. If it means that it was the practice that worked at that time, probably the answer is ambiguous. I find the question too vague. Anyway, I'm against whipping, so my answer, I answer no. So here, no. In this kind of probes, we want to, this kind of opinion from the participants. I don't want them to interpret descriptively. What do you want? We are judging, you are proving participants' evaluative judgments. So it's important. So there is an ambiguity here. Okay? So it's a difficult methodological problem. But if you don't take into account this kind of uh, justification, don't even know how people are answering. Okay? So this is one problem. When we saw in analysis justifications, every time that there was this problem clearly evoked, normally, if you take the qualitative uh, evidence, they go in the direction of Turio, interestingly. Okay, so it's something that already qualifies the uh, prima facie evidence. But then we think that you should also do qualitative analysis of justification. Nowadays, there is this kind of passion that every justification is just pure confabulation. Okay? I am against this. I think there's a kind of a blatant simplification that you know, is leading people to miss a lot of important data. Sure, you know, reasons that people give, many times they are confabulation, not denying this. But sometimes they do have uh, psychological insight about their own processes. I'm not saying here is that it's not all the time that when people uh, reflect about their psychological processes that they are completely out of the mark. And to show confabulation, uh, you have to give evidence. Also, there is incoherence. And, uh, so I don't know if you had the chance to read this uh, the last uh, book of Sperber and uh, Hugo Mechier. Uh, the enigma of reasoning. I think they put the point there very interestingly. There are three three ways that reasons play a role. Okay, when you justify things, one is pure confabulation. Most of the time, you're confabulating. You know, sometimes reason does play a, a causal role because you take reasons to make decisions. You know, they, they part even they are. But sometimes they also in, uh, involve in, in, uh, psychological insight about your processes. Although most intuitive reasoning, by definition, intuitive uh, inference, you don't have uh, access to the process that lead, led to the intuition, does not mean that they are completely outside of your, 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 your awareness. That, for example, when people say that you see a, a scenario of injustice and you ask quite strongly, you say, oh, because this is unfair, is this confabulation? Is it that when people say unfair, it's completely unrelated to the criteria that they utilized to make their judgment of wrongdoing? I don't think so. So I think you do have to take analysis of justification in general uh, uh, into account. So our prediction, remember that our, our uh, deflationary hypothesis is that it's when people interpret cases of causation of harm as involving justice that they will have this idea that, oh, this really intrinsically wrong. So if an authority says that it's not wrong, I'm not going to change my opinion. If people do this anywhere else, my intuition is still wrong because this is not taking into account of interests of others. This is kind of selfish type of behavior. So our prediction in relation between in the, on the relation between harm and the moral signature was the following. Okay? We did analysis of justification in our data. Whenever a, particip a participant answers not OK to the permissibility probe, the OK first question, and their answer is driven by concerns within, with ju justice, their answer to the moral signature, authority continues or genera generality probe, will be not OK as well, based upon the same concerns. The alternative hypothesis, that's the one that uh, Fessler uh, and Stitch were putting forward, even if a participant answers not OK to the permissibility probe, the manipulation check probe, the first one, and their answer is driven by concerns with injustice, 
their answer to the moral signature, authority continues, or gener generality, probe, may be okay based upon the normative force of an authority or the normative force of a social consensus that is distance, distant in space or time. Uh, so here we created, to do serious analysis of, of justification, you have to create a, you know, categories of justifications, create a coding scheme, and then not only you analyze, apply the coding scheme to the evidence, but also what people call interrated reliability. You train other people who are unaware of the hypothesis to code the same data. And if you reach a reasonable agreement between you as a coder and other independent coders that are completely unaware of the hypothesis, then your interpretation of the data is, is reasonable. And we did that. And we had a very high kind of interrated reliability. And our results was here. So just focus in the no-no pattern of response. First thing here, you can see in the three scenarios, most of the no-no responses involve justification of justice, rights, and welfare. We said justice, rights, welfare because of a category is not based on ordinary language. The notion of justice that we have in mind is broader, okay? So but you see here in the three scenarios, most of the no-no answers, they involve justifications of related to injustice. So the number of justifications was extremely large for all paired scenarios. Justice, rights, welfare justifications were most related to answers of the no-no response pattern. But here is, we're not taking individually the pattern of response to individual responses, okay? So now there's another table. Here we see, again, in terms of number of participants who not only invoked injustice justifications in one, but in both probes, they analyzed, because in this case, a detail that I forgot to, to mention, we, want, we ask participants to justify their probes both for the manipulation check probe, the first question of moral conventional test, and other, and also for the second uh, probe, the one related to uh, generality or authority independence. And what you find here in this table is that for the cases, oh, sorry, this prisoner authority and training authorities are, are unrelated to what I'm, I'm showing here, because these are the other two scenarios that, but take the three first cases. Slavery gener generality, we weeping generality, weeping authority. So, first, in the no no response pattern, it's about only a small number of participants did not use justifications. Okay? Comparison the total, here is the total, and here is the total. None is the amount, the number of participants who did not use justification related to injustice. Okay? Now, the second point is important as well. In the three scenarios, the three first scenarios there that I'm describing in this, in this presentation, mm -hmm. most participants emphasized the same kind of justification rate to injustice in both, both the first OK question and for the second question related to authority independent or general ability. Basically, they said, oh, this is unfair. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not changing my opinion. It's still unfair. It's still unfair. And of course, those who emphasize in only one of the pros probably is just a question of relevance. Why are they going to be repeating things? Okay. So overall, conclusion, the overall evidence, we believe, favors our basic deflationary view on the relation between harm and morality. Thank you. So Okay, Paulo, thank you. Uh, let's, well, we, we have uh, about 15 uh, or 20 minutes for questions. Uh, let's wait a minute for the, the people on the chat. So, yeah, and whatever you want to ask. You know, even question of clarification because a little bit fast and this stuff, there is some part of this debate is very technical. For those of you who do not have background on the moral conventional task and the more the theory of tradition, so yeah. feel free to ask any kind of question, qualification, or whatever. 
Well, I, I, I learned a lot about uh, the, the different ways to justify my intuitions about morality. You have a, <laughs> a, a very large <laughs> list of ways to justify intuitions about morality. Uh, hi, Paulo. He Sophia hey. speaking. Are you hearing? Last yeah. Speaker. I can. Can you, you hear me? Want to speak in Portuguese as well? There's no problem. <laughs> okay. So I would like to know. Um, I I am curious to know what you understand by justice in your research. Is the, is a kind of understanding of what uh, of uh, equilibrium uh, and this, do you think people are always um, trying to equal what is in a kind of not in balance is this the, the main um, I don't know property of of being just do you think so or what what do you think uh, people understand by justice what do you think about uh, have you done oh, yeah. some okay, research so on that on develop that? a little bit uh, okay let me develop a little bit more the uh, what I, I i meant by that general uh, idea about taking to account the interest of others so As I said, I'm uh, more recently. I've been influenced uh, by you know the work by Bomai and, and uh, Spurber. I think that intuition of injustice, although I, I, I don't completely buy all the, the, the their picture, uh, but I think that intuitions of fairness or injustice. I don't think this, those words uh, interchangeably. Although Bomai uses, she separates uh, fairness from from justice a little bit. In, it's too com too complicated but my I, I, idea is that you, you know, first there is an idea of impartiality related you know other there are two components basically there is an idea of impartiality in terms of you know you have to respect the interests of others and selfishness but there also there is an idea of proportionality you know uh, this idea of proportionality is just dessert you, you suppose you have uh, you are in an enterprise with a friend, you start to do some cooperating to do something, and there's a division of labor. If you do much more than your friend, there will be intuitions that you deserve more of the result of your collaboration than uh, the other friend who did much less. So it's not about equity uh, in, in to court, okay? It's calibrated by a sense of proportionality as well. So that's the general idea, and I think people have, people are tuned when they interpret the the behavior of other people. They are always, and this is part of related to a part of folk psychology in a way. People are attuned, always interpreting about the reasons that people are involved when people are behaving. So people are tuned, quite attuned, to, to uh, perceive when people are being selfish or not, when people are really concerned about the interests of others. So I think the mechanism that I'm talking about problems that injustice the words is very kind of charged in terms of philosophical baggage and you know, the problem that we have to word to use some word to talk about word, uh, the concept that we have in mind. So my intuition is just something very basic about Perceiving whether someone is really cons concerned about uh, other people is not, con it's not, and it's not uh, about being altruistic. It's nothing about being altruistic. You're not, you're not, not selfishness in the sense that you are expecting that people uh, are going to sell all their uh, property to give to the poor. Okay, it's about a balance of interests. Okay, people accept that you can pursue your own interests, but you also perceive that there are limits to your, you know, the way you pursue 
your interests, you have to take into account the interests of others. And I think people are really attuned to that, attuned to that. And when people perceive that an action uh, violates this, involves this kind of selfish, when they attribute a selfish reason, this sense to people, think you have an intuition that it's wrong. And, uh, and the intuition is really strong, and you don't, uh, you know. Of course, people may say that you may change your opinion, but the point is that you may change your opinion because you may reinterpret the situation. Suppose that, look, but it's obvious. Suppose that you see someone hurting another person, okay? And uh, you, as a default assumption, you suppose, oh, this guy is being selfish because it's not really being. Now, if you have more information about the situation, you interpret the situation as a situation of, uh, oh, the person who is being hurt really is a bastard, has done a bunch of, if you interpret this as a situation of punishment, then you are interrupting completely the situation. Then, you know, justified punishment, it is driven by the, the sense of uh, the fairness. Then there's a balance. The person deserves being punished because she, the person had before not taken into account the interest of others. So there's a sense of balance of punishment plays a role there as well in terms of deservedness. I don't know whether I answered your question, but that's my, my, the basic notion of uh, uh, justice that I, I have in mind. When I, when I say that the deflationary view of harm is that it's when people, and this thing is, I'm talking about sufficient conditions, okay? Not necessary and sufficient conditions, okay? Just saying, when people, if you perceive someone causing harm to another person, you think that this person is doing that for selfish reasons, then you have this strong intuition that is wrong in the sense of the moral signature. I also have a clarification. I I... Hello, Paulo. It's Adriano. Yes. Thank you a lot for your talk. I'm, uh, I'm a philosopher, yes. and I'm interested in justification. I, I wrote something about that, uh, working on uh, the work of another philosopher, which is uh, Tugendhat. And I'm interested in your view as a uh, 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 scientist, a, uh, uh, a man who is uh, trained in anthropology, as I understood. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, OK. Yeah. How do you? Psychologist, kind of co more broadly a cognitive scientist. Uh, cognitive scientist. I mean, yeah. How do you use the, or do you understand uh, the concept of giving reasons. Uh, uh, when we uh, give justifications for our action, it's like, uh, and you said that in your answer to Sophia, that, and also in your talk, that we are giving reasons, explaining why we are using, so giving reasons. How do you interpret this giving reasons? Uh, philosophers used to think about uh, this concept as um, highly rational because of the word reason. Um, and, but your experiment shows that people usually uh, deal with that in a much less abstract sense than philosophers think. So how is your approach, what is your approach to giving reasons? How do you understand that, please? Uh, I'm saying, I'm not, I don't think it's abstract what I'm saying. I think people give, what are the two basic uh, situations where the people give reason? People give reason to justify their beliefs and to justify their actions. And it's just a, you know, why do you believe? There are two I or their answers. In the case you want to probe like this, they say yes or no, justify their judgments, okay, what they believe in a broad sense what is the case, but it's still wrong. Bro. So I take this as just a psychological phenomenon. I, I, if you want to, uh, I would, I, this, the, the book by Sperber, uh, uh, Messier and, and, and Sperber, The Enigma of Reason, I think I more or less buy their approach to reasons. It's a, you know, this is part of human psychology, you are attributing reasons why why you do that. 
you know, they have this kind of argumentative, it's a broader, not simply argumentative theory of it. They have a, an evolutionary account of why uh, uh, this type of reasoning and justifying beliefs and decisions through uh, reason, how it evolved. I think it's a psychological mechanism, as you have other psychological mechanisms in the mind. So my approach is purely psychological, and uh, you know I would try. To, I would think about it in terms of uh, a specific type of uh, psychological phenomena. Giving reasons is something that humans do all the time. And what I was trying to say is that I think people are tuned. They attribute reasons as well as part of this broad folk psychology in a broad sense. Okay, or a specific type of uh, matter representational device. You attributing uh, reasons to people is the way you make sense of behavior and also to to justify yourself. So my approach is broadly psychological. I you know I know that there is all this discussion about in philosophy, you know, internal versus external reasons, and ac actually they discuss a little bit this uh, in, in, the, in the book as well. Uh, but I, my approach is basic psychological. So when people are giving, as I was trying to say, okay, so what is the image that's now in, in psychology? Reasons are just confabulation. There's nothing to do with, uh, you know, if I give a reason, yes, it's no, no, it's not okay. And I explain that it's because it's unfair. If I say something, it's unfair to to have a slavery, for example. Okay. Okay, Paulo, so we have we have a question from Eva. Uh, could you read it in the chat, please? Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, okay. Thanks for uh, a bunch. Okay, thank. Is this talk you focused on the distinction between moral and conventional evidence? Curious about the third category of act that. Uh, called victims crimes like incest and bestiality and period are this uh, in all, are these moral violations also linked to fundamental representation of harm ah, interesting question because there are you know one recent debate uh, nowadays you know, people uh, criticizing uh, moral foundation theory is you know, what is the name of the guy? Sorry, name completely. There is a, there is a new wave of people now. It's a, it's a guy, a very young guy. He has published a lot, trying to reduce everything to harm. Okay. What is his name? It came out of my mind now. Maybe I should. Anyway, there is one specific researcher nowadays that's trying to reduce all more, uh, all uh, high, small, yeah. Kurt Gray, thanks. Sorry, for name. There is try to. It's an a counter criticism to its tutorial, saying that oh, everything that Hayek is saying, all bestiality, everything is about harm. But the problem is first, I have the, there are two problems there. I do think that there may be, he may be right a little bit in terms of some of these scenarios. People still, from the point of view of the participant, they still think that there is something about causation of harm there. Now, this is one thing. The other thing is that I completely disagree with his research. I think it's completely flawed, completely flawed. And we have just an article that is submitted that trying to show this. Because the point is that he's ambiguous about the way he used the word harm. It's completely fallacious because First, he oscillate between harm in the pure sense of causation of punishment and suffering or welfare reduction and harm in the sense that involves injustice. Okay? So, and he's trying to say that it's harm independent of injustice. And he used the word harm in his probes. So, basically, we think that his approach is completely flawed because we think that what is going on is not about harm in the, the relevant sense. Because if we start to talk about use harm in the way that already connotes injustice, then there's no point. It's a non-starter, okay? because it's just confusing. So I think his work is confused 
And we have some evidence showing that uh, when you prove all these kind of different domains, the most important one is injustice. But there is evidence for moral pluralism as well. But the harm in itself, in terms of judgments about pain and suffering, or welfare rejection, welfare reduction, is not does not do the most of the. It's very restricted job in terms of judgments of wrongdoing. So. In relation to his research, I think he's right to say that uh, that some of the the uh, domains that Haidt is saying that is completely unrelated to harm may be people participants may interpret of involving harm. Okay, I think this is a fair. I think he's completely wrong to reduce morality to harm because I defend a completely deflationary view of harm. Harm in itself is completely, it's, it's relevant, but it, it's not enough for moral judgments because it's the basic trivial fact. Causation of harm in many, many circumstances are just permitted. So harm cannot do the job in terms of moral judgments that uh, Kurt Gray is trying to do. So I, I have an article uh, submitted. You know, I don't know whether, because the problem is that Kurt Gray is really, if one, one articles go to him as a reviewer, he tries to undermine everything. So the problem is that is the, the, uh, what happens in this case is the, the tyranny of the literature. When people become famous, they try to, and they are reviewers of everything. You, you try to publish, you're always in trouble. Because you send this article with this kind of reviewers that whatever they're criticizing, then they try to undermine. So it's a, the politics of academia is horrible. The problem is that, for me, it's really, trivially, obviously flawed. And basically, I think Kurt Gray is basically the kind of what is bad about psychology because he uses these tricky ways of manipulating ordinary languages, polysemous, and he uses the word harm in the proof about harm, but harm in English. Obviously, there is already connotation of wrongdoing, connotation of injustice, so his manipulation probe does not differentiate different domains. So I think his stuff about harm is, I, I really don't like, I think it's really I don't really like it. I, but, but basically, it's because I assume a deflationary uh, position in, in relation to harm and, and moral judgments of wrongdoing. If you have a reasonable delimited characterization of harm, then it does not work. I don't know whether it's. Okay. Well. Uh... I suppose you know, he's, he's, he's attacking some. Yeah, I, I hope it's going to be published, but you know, <laughs> let's see. Okay. Uh, the problem is that this stuff, you know, social psychology is kind of, now there's, this two cha there's two groups now, they're polarized, it's Haidt and Kurt Gray. Then if you try to do something different, it's really, anyway, okay. I can send you the article if you want to get it published, for sure. Well, Paulo, uh, thank you, thank you again for your answers uh, and for your talk. We are looking forward to, to right. see you again you already in another time in the future. Brazilians as well because I'm a Brazilian. I look yeah, yeah. I've been living abroad for a long time, but I still. <laughs> okay. It's well, good now now you must go uh, forward in your schedule. Okay, and you are invited okay. to to keep okay. online to to watch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Paulo. Paulo.